This is Lanier Smith, and I'm going to tell you a story. Nineteen twenty, Martine Belfort, nearly asleep, as she soaked in her tub, barely opened one eye at the offensive jangling urgency of the contraption on her vanity. Why she had ever installed a telephone in her bathroom escaped her for the moment. Juju, hold it up to my ear. The maid did as she was told. Hello, hello, Martine, are you there? It was Cecile Duval, her dearest source of gossip and most distrusted friend. Cecile, are you back in Paris already? I thought you were in Cannes. <gasps> I am, ma chère, but simply had to call you at once. The most amazing thing happened at dinner. Martine closed her eyes and sank to her chin in the tub and nodded to Juju to turn on the hot tap and warm her up. Oh, do tell. Who is your infatuation this time? A duke or some American millionaire? It is Coco Chanel. Martine shot up in the tub, eyes wide open. Are you having an affair with Chanel? No, no, silly pet. I have news about her. Oh, I never liked that woman. What happened? Did she stay out in the sun too long and burn to a crisp? Is she dead? No, nothing like that. My goodness, what an imagination you have, Martine. She was dining at the same restaurant as I tonight, and I kept noticing a commotion at her table, people going over and bumping about and hovering over her. Soon the entire restaurant was a buzz. A buzz about what, Cecile? Get to the point. Finally, I couldn't stand any longer, and I went over and say hello. You know, sniff around and see what on earth could be so fascinating. Coco gave me a cool smile. She knows we are friends, you and I, and, well, she was very cool, but cordial. I kissed her cheek, and then it happened. Oh, mon Dieu, what? What happened? She must have spilled a whole bottle of perfume on the tablecloth, and herself as well. Common as dirt, that woman. No, Martine, you don't understand. She smelled amazing. And unlike anything I've ever smelled, it was so, so sexy. I was about to ask her what it was that when the Grand Duchess Zina Valdemarovich and a few of her Russian ladies interrupted me to ask her the exact same question. Martine looked over at her vanity, packed with Patou, Guerlain, Caron, and Coty. Coco said it was something she found in grass, and that she couldn't remember exactly where. Then she asked us, did we like it? Did we think she should try and get more? My dear, it all clicked. She's launching a perfume. It was a setup. She had perfumed the table like a trap, and my dear, it worked. We all fell into it. I simply have to have it. Nothing else smells like it. Nothing. Don't be ridiculous, Cecile. I doubt very much that... Mademoiselle Chanel would dare to go up against those big men and those giant perfume houses. And if she does, she will be ruined. She nearly snorted. I, for one, would never wear it. 1921. Martine Belfort had only one bottle of perfume on her vanity, Chanel No. 5. All the smart women of Paris agreed that nothing other than No. 5 would do. 1945. Sergeant Bo Henson stood for a very long time on the sidewalk at East Mountain Street, looking up at the ha handsome Spanish Revival House where she lived. This beautiful, peaceful street in Glendale, California, was a million miles away from the horrors of Remagen and the battle where he lost his best buddy, Jack McCraft. A soft breeze riffle, ruffled his hair and reminded him to put his cap back on. He was in full uniform, as befitted the duty for his friend. Marjorie McCraff answered the door. She was wearing a sundress, and her hair was the color of corn silk. She looked much younger than twenty-six. She invited him in, as if she had known him for years. They had iced tea and talked for a long time about Jack, 
and what it was like before the war. Marjorie asked Beau about his life and if he was married. She was sitting on the, on the chair he knew had been Jack's favorite. In war, you learn everything about your buddies' lives back home, down to who they first kissed, their favorite radio show, to name, to the name of their dog. Finally, Marjorie asked how it happened, and if Bo was with him. He told her the best lie he could, that Jack didn't suffer. Then he told her a bit of the truth, that he was with him when he died. When we were in Paris in 44, there was just one thing he had to do. He had to get this for you. He took out a little travel-worn package out of his pocket and handed it to her. Jack said you always talked about going to Paris together some day and buying a bottle. We stood together in the rain all that day in a line of GIs on the Rue Gambon so he could buy it and bring it home and to surprise you. I saved it for you. Marjorie carefully opened the package. It was the first time she cried since the day the letter came from the army telling her that Jack would not come home. She never opened the bottle, but kept it next to Jack's photograph on her vanity. 1962. It was there on her dresser, all alone and forgotten. There in that naked bedroom, with no paintings on the walls, just an unmade bed and some shoe boxes and purses stacked by the door, and a phone off the hook on the carpet by the bed. Some happier years before, back on Doheny Drive, she had said it was all she slept in, and there were all those photographs to prove it. She wrapped sensuously in sheets with the bottle on the nightstand, each adding heat to the legend of the other. Now, she was cold and wrapped in a blanket in the back of an ambulance. The bottle of Chanel No. 5 sitting on her dresser would be tossed out or possibly snatched as a souvenir by some policeman to take home to his wife. In any case, it was there on the dresser when she died. 2014. Chanel number 5, I don't get it, Jackie Belfort said as, to her girlfriend as she reached for a tester of Co Coco Mademoiselle at the Macy's perfume counter, inspected it, and then handed it to her friend Tiffany McGreef. It smells old lady, she said. I just don't see what the big deal is. So what if Marilyn Monroe wore it? I know, said Tiffany. It smells soapy, just like palm olive. Ew. She put down the bottle of Coco Mademoiselle and picked up a bottle of number five. Jackie grabbed the number five from Tiffany and fingered the beveled edge. It is a pretty bottle. My grandmother wore it all the time. She said she even bought the first bottle when it came out. She said she was the best friends with Coco Chanel. Can you imagine? No kidding. How funny. My granny had a little bottle next to a picture of my grandpa, but she never wore it. I can never understand why. Not even Brad Pitt could get me to wear it. She spritzed a generous spray onto the Chanel tester paper. Ugh, old lady, all right. Oh, my God, Tiffany, have you smelled Miss Dior? Yummy. She snapped the, her bubble gum. Oh, my God. It is so sweet and fruity. I just love sweet and fruity, don't you? Have you tried the new Jessica Simpson perfume? Oh, my God, no. Let's go to Sephora and find it. As soon as they were gone... The woman behind the counter, who, was, who wasn't much older than Jackie and Tiffany, turned to the woman next to her. Barbarians. The old lady is a survivor, and for good reason. She is a classic for the ages, and often misunderstood by those who have no sense of history of what a real perfume means and smells like. It may even be that she is, for some, an acquired taste, like avocados or escargot. In other words, some people have to grow into it. By that, I don't mean that it has anything to do with how old you are. On the contrary, there are those who love this perfume from a very early age. I think it has more to do with where your nose is on its journey through the world of perfume. Whatever the case may be for you and Chanel No. 5, love it, hate it, the perfume is something to be admired for its place in, history, in the history of perfume. For the woman who commissioned its creation, and for the man, Ernest Beau, who created it. Of course, it's all about the aldehydes in the opening. This is the popping of a cork of Dom Perignon of aldehydes. It is fizzing white and glorious as it catapults a cork out of Neroli Ylang Ylang 
lemon, and bergamot across the room to ricochet off the walls and unleash its legendary florals at its heart. In the heart notes, there are three floral sisters of Iris, Lily of the Valley, and Rose, are the frame for the most famous jasmine in the world, the star of the show, the grass jasmine, picked at dawn just for Chanel. A luxurious and earthy orris root brings a dark and sexy touch to the center of notes of number five. This is pure adult glamour that speaks in soft, full tones. Of elegance and pure sophisticated style and grace, the dry-down is creative and brilliant blending of oak moss, sandalwood, amber, rich and glowing in the late stages. It is also very Parisian. A, a bit of sexy skank comes to play in the form of civet. I always love a bit of animalic frolic in my florals. It keeps it real for me, real in the sense of a classic French perfume of the past, and that little Naughty makes a good time even better. There's a touch of patchouli, musk, vanilla, vetiver down there too, but the major factor is how the civet plays with the oak moss, amber, and a fading glory of the florals. It is really spectacular, and I can see when I compare it from the opening to fade out to other perfumes that survive some for, in some form before 1921, how revolutionary and special Chanel Number no. 5 was and still is. The women, the old ladies, if you will, who first wore it were the most exciting and free generation of women in 2,000 years. They sent their bows off to die in the trenches of the Great War. Those in America of the 48 states and in Great Britain won the vote. With the help of Chanel, they cut their hair, threw away their corsets, rolled down their stockings, and raised their skirts to scandalous heights. They smoked and drank with men, danced shocking dances like the black bottom and the shimmy, and the tango. When they went to work and left home in, in ways and numbers they never had before, they kept their families together and going forward through the Great Depression, and then sent their husbands and some sons off to die in World War II. They were the foundation of womanhood for the 20th century and the mothers, mothers of feminism. Those are the women who first wore Chanel No. 5 and made it a legend. There are women I know who tell me that Chanel No. 5 is only, the only perfume they can wear. And when you come to know and understand the complexity and brilliance of Number 5, it is easy to understand that statement. It is also a perfume I grew up smelling on the women in my family. When I smell it today, I don't see the old women they, ha they have become, but the beautiful young women they were and always will be in my heart.